Welcome once again to MLB Network's countdown of the 20 greatest games of the last 50 seasons with Tom Verducci. I'm Bob Costas. Number 20 on the countdown came from the 1970s, that crazy 23-22 game between the Phillies and Cubs from 1979. Number 19, a little more recent, 2003 NLDS and that exciting win by the Marlins over the Giants. So now we're up to number 18, and this one comes from 1980, Game 5 NLCS, the Phillies, and the Astros, not only was this a great game in and of itself, but it was the culmination of an incredible series in which four of the five games went extra innings, controversies, all kinds of comebacks. This thing had everything. Including great players. Pete Rose, Joe Morgan, Nolan Ryan, Mike Schmidt. Pretty nice cast. So here we go. Game number 18 on the countdown coming up. Well, Tom, people are going to begin to think through the first few installments of this series that Larry Boa is a regular. He was with <laughs> us for number 20 as the Phillies shortstop in that 23-22 game at Wrigley in 79. And now a game not quite as crazy, still crazy, but much more significant because the pennant is on the line. Game five at the Astrodome in 1980, your fills on the Astros. Well, it, the, the noise in that place was deafening. Uh, it was unbelievable. You couldn't hear yourself talk, couldn't hear yourself think, and... To see Nolan Ryan and, and Marty Bystrom go against each other, obviously the odds weren't in our favor. But as this game turns out, we, we ended up having a pretty good ball game. Some background is necessary here. Your Phillies had lost the LCS. No divisions then, no division series then, two divisions per league. So you went right from winning your division into one step from the World Series. You lost to the Reds in 76 the Dodgers in 77 and again in 78. Now here you are in 80. This is getting old for you guys. It's getting real old because we had read all summer that if we didn't get the next step, they were going to break up the club. The owners knew we had a decent team, but there was something missing, and we'd come up short all those years. But we've, we read all summer long that if this year doesn't get it done, then they're going to break up the ball club. Well, there was nothing old about postseason baseball in Houston, Texas. This actually is the first series ever, postseason baseball, in Texas. And the Astros are a team that enjoyed a home field advantage all year long in that spacious ballpark. 55 wins at home. They gave up only 22 home runs all year at home. And you talked about the noise. Those people have been waiting a long time to see postseason baseball. Well, the fact is that they had great pitching. And, and people don't realize how good that pitching staff was. And uh, at that time, the fences in the dome, there, there weren't short fences. You had to hit it out of the ballpark. And it was a huge ballpark. And their ball club had great defense and good pitching. And we knew we were going to have our hands filled. The format was 2-3. So the first two games were in Philadelphia. Games 3-4-5 were in Houston. There were no home runs hit by either team in those three games. In fact, there was only one home run in the whole series. Greg Luzinski essentially won game one in Philadelphia with a homer. Mike Schmidt led the National League with 48 home runs. He was blanked in that respect. This was kind of a throwback series. I mean, after all, Houston's home run leader for the year was Terry Poole with 13. Exactly. And the thing about uh, uh, Schmidt, he probably had the worst series that he had in the last 10 years that he'd been playing. It was, her, it was a bad series for him, and he, I think he put so much pressure on himself because he had such a great year. But as it turned out, after us winning this ball game, he had a great World Series. A word about how the Astros got there. They went into Dodger Stadium, up on the Dodgers by three with three to play, end of the season. The Dodgers swept the series and forced a one-game playoff, also in L.A. the next day, the Monday after the conclusion of the regular season. Behind Joe Necro, the Astros won that game 7-1. So they've been on the brink for a week plus. Oh, they, they get used to playing low-scoring games all year long, but you're right. They're playing under the gun now for a two-week stretch. Remember, too, one of their best arms on the staff, J.R. Richard, is not in this postseason. In fact, as it turned out, his major league career is over after suffering a stroke. And you're talking about someone who had an ERA under two the, that year, mm -hmm. one of the most feared strikeout pitchers in baseball at the time. And I think in more recent terms, we think of Schilling and Johnson with the 0-1 Diamondbacks. If you had Ryan and Richard back-to-back -back in the Astros rotation, they'd be even more formidable. Well, let me tell you, if, if, if Richard doesn't have the stroke, 
he might have set all kinds of pitching records. This guy was a dominating right-hander. I know our two guys in the middle of the lineup, Lazinski and Schmidt, hated facing him, and him not being in that rotation was definitely a plus for us going into this series. How about if they came at you with Richard or Ryan first, then Joe Necro flutterballing, and then back with the other fireballer third, your head would be spinning. Oh, it was an unbelievable team to have to go up there and, and score runs against. I mean, we knew the run, runs were going to be at a premium. We had to play little ball. We had to move runners and things of that nature. But uh, they were like that all year. They had a great pitching staff, speed, and they, had, and they caught the ball exceptionally well. Quick recap. Game one, Carlton starts for you guys. Lozinski hits the homer. You win in Philadelphia. Game two, they come back and win in ten innings, seven to four. Game three, Necro pitches ten shutout innings. Joe Morgan hits a key triple in the 11th. They win the game one nothing. So you guys are down two games to one. You go to game four. You start Carlton. You're still losing 2 nothing going to the eighth. You score three to take the lead. The game goes to extra innings again. Third time in four games you've gone extras. You guys win that game in 10, 5 to 3. But that game wasn't just extra innings. That game had one of the strangest plays ever with the umpire Doug Harvey right in the middle of it. Well, there was a line drive back to the pitcher. It really wasn't a line drive. He got jammed. I think it was Gary Maddox. And the ball short hopped uh, the pitcher. And Doug Harvey at the time threw up his arms, and the runners running, were, they didn't know what the, what the call was out, safe, what. So it, as it turned out, it could have been a triple play. But the umpires met together. They ruled it a double play. And back then, you very seldom see umpires get together. The umpire says, It's my call. I got mm -hmm. it right. Eventually, they got it right, which helped us. But at that time, you're saying, Now what else can happen in this series? Because as you said, Every game was extra innings. Every team kept battling back. You get behind, the other team come up. We'd go ahead, they'd, they'd, they'd come up and tie us. They'd go ahead, we would tie them. It was a back and forth. It was really a dogfight the whole series. So not only was the series tied 2-2, and this is the climactic game now in the best of five format, but the nature of these four games, to get it to this point, as Larry just explained, was already epic. So at the beginning of Game 5, Game 4 was still the main talking point. And here's how Keith Jackson opened up the broadcast of Game 5 on ABC. Unusual, uncommon, unprecedented, unbelievable, incredible, astonishing. That was Game 4. Arguments, protests, conferences, change decisions, and just plain old mistakes. All marked. Game four. And admitted gamble by Pete Rose left Philadelphia to a life-giving 5-3 win. Now one game for the National League pennant. It's a bit of a period piece as well. When you take a look at a, a booth shot, they're all in those hideous canary yellow ABC <laughs> signature jackets. Unbelievable, Keith, uncanny, <laughs> unprecedented. Astonishing. <laughs> and Keith, Keith's going with the man mountain beard. Cosell's just being Cosell, right? Keith looked like he was getting ready for deer season. I mean, I've never seen that before. <laughs> Don Drysdale's in there as well. Exactly. So, so this has a broadcast. Leaving the game aside, as a broadcast is pretty darn entertaining, uh, and then too. Then we get a headline that says, Rose's gamble pays off. <laughs> You know. Rose with Pete was out by 20 feet. I mean, he ran through a stop sign, and it just so happened to throw short hop Bochi, and he just plowed him over, as Pete Rose would do. And uh, that was a big play for us at the time. Okay, so the stage is set, and when we come back, it's Game 5 of the 1980 NLCS. You're watching MLB's 20 Greatest Games. Let's take a look at the starting lineup for the Phillies. Pete Rose at the top. Then Bake McBride, Schmidt, who wound up five for 24 with six strikeouts in the series, Luzinski in the cleanup spot, Trio, who offensively and defensively was never better than in this five game stretch, the terrific defensive center fielder Gary Maddox, our Larry Boa is at shortstop, Bob Boone is the catcher, Marty Bystrom, not the youngest guy ever to start a postseason game, but one of the most inexperienced, brought up in September, five starts, won them all, five and oh. Still, you're handing him the ball against Nolan Ryan. Well, the pressure there obviously had to be immense for him. But without him, we, will, we do not win our division. This guy came up out of the minor leagues. Uh, we knew he had good stuff. We didn't know he was going to do what he did, 5-0. and oh. And then he, he matched 0-for-0 zero zero with, with Ryan. He went into the sixth inning, I think. And then Dallas had to take him out. But without him, 
we would have been watching the World Series. And Larry, you talked about needing to play little ball in that ballpark. That's a great Philadelphia lineup. Second in the league in runs scored, mm -hmm. first in slugging, first in total bases. There was a lot of thump in that lineup. We had a lot of thump. I mean, we, and we could do, we could beat you two to one. We could beat you ten to nine. We caught the ball. We had guys that could steal bases. It was a complete lineup, basically. Uh, Depth-wise, in the rotation, might have been a little bit of a weakness. We had a good back end of the bullpen, and we knew we were pretty good, but we just kept coming up short, and we knew we had to win this series. Dallas could have gone with Dick Ruthven, who had opposed Nolan Ryan in game two. So he, like Ryan, would have been going on three days rest. He had had a very good year, veteran pitcher. But it must have been Dallas Green's gut that this kid, Marty Bystrom, was on a roll, and he'd go with him. Well, one thing about Dallas Green, he wasn't afraid to use kids. That whole month of September when we were scraping, he brought up some guys to sort of, he says, wake up the veterans. I remember bringing up Lonnie Smith, Keith Moreland. Those guys played. And he wasn't afraid to throw a rookie out there. And obviously what Bystrom did in the month of September, he was going to reward him. You know, he said, hey, without you, we're not here. You get the ball. Bill Verdon, who found himself in the middle of some of the most memorable games in baseball history, remember the Pirates in 1960 and that game seven, he's the manager of the Houston Astros. And here is his lineup. Terry Poole at the top. Enos Cabell is at third. Joe Morgan, who had his greatest years with Big Red Machine, but is still a very valuable guy, is the second baseman hitting third. Jose Cruz in the cleanup spot. Denny Walling, Art Howe, Luis Pujols, Craig Reynolds, the shortstop, and Nolan Ryan on the mound. Now, here's a guy who'd win more than 300 games, pitched seven no-hitters, the all-time leader in strikeouts. He goes against Marty Bystrom. Well, we knew we had our work cut out for us. We had faced Nolan Ryan a number of times, not only in Houston, but our ball club faced him when he was with the Mets. And we knew what a competitor he was. Uh, we felt that it was going to be a very low-scoring game. As it turned out, it was for a while. And then, obviously, the wheels fell off for both teams. And both teams ended up scoring a lot of runs. Now, Nolan Ryan is going on short rest in this game, which is not even worth mentioning in 1980. Right. Today, it's a big deal. Nolan Ryan made more than a third of his major league starts on three days or fewer. So they're not asking him to do anything that was anything out of the ordinary. And he had only pitched into the seventh inning in game seven. So for him, that's a relatively low pitch count. Tom, this guy was a horse. I mean, he never got tired. He kept grunting when he threw. You know, fastballs 97, 98, unbelievable curveball. He would th pitch inside, use both sides of the plate. He, was, he had a mean streak in him when he was on the mound. So we knew that going in, this was going to be a tough battle. With our kid on the mound, Bystrom, we wanted to keep it close, and uh, it was a good ball game. Okay, let's get it started. Top of the first inning, Pete Rose leading off against Nolan Ryan. And it's a typical Rose reaction. From These the are two crowd. great competitors Pete right here. I mean, Pete, Pete didn't want to get, let him get him out, and Ryan didn't want him to get any hits. So right from the start, you can see the intensity with both these guys facing each other. Right there, we thought it might be a long day because if Nolan Ryan's going to get that pitch, that's what the first thing Pete said. He said, if he gets that pitch, it's going to be a long day. Side corner to the right handers, it will have a tendency to tail and sink away. Rose really not too happy with that call. This pitch is off the plate. That's a veteran umpire back there, yep. Ed Vargo. Well, you can watch the way Pujols pulls that ball back. <laughs> he knew it was outside. They all knew it was all outside. <laughs> all right, so Ryan gets through the first without incident. And now here's Marty Bystrom on the mound. Facing an Astro lineup, which, by the way, does not include perhaps their best all-round player, Cesar Cedeno, who injured his ankle in game three of this series and was done for the rest of the series. So here's Terry Poole starting it off. Well, let me tell you about Terry Poole. This guy might have had the hottest series I've ever seen of any hitter. It didn't matter what we threw him. Fastballs, curveballs, change-up sliders. He hit the ball hard and often, and he had a tremendous World ser uh, playoff series. So he leads off with a hit. A batter later, there's one out, he's still at first, and Joe Morgan is at the plate. To me, this man is the story of this series. A great professional. Even though Joe Morgan was towards the end of his career here, he was a threat. And our pitchers knew it, and we had to pitch this guy very carefully, because if you made a mistake, he was going to hurt you. Here goes Poole. They came out very aggressive. I mean, they, they're going to test this rookie and try to put some people in motion. Now, Joe hits this ball pretty well, but this is the Astrodome. This he, doesn't even make the track. That's not even close, and he did hit that ball very well. And you see the aggressiveness of Poole right there. Good speed, 
uh, he really made that ball club go. So pool tags and advances. And this brings up Jose Cruz, who's in the cleanup spot, man at third, bottom of the first, two out, no score. Third and Cruz, like Morgan, has walked six times so far. Two two to Jose Cruz. Right side, base hit, Houston gets the lead. Cruz scores from third. And right away, the crowd's into it exceptionally right there because scoring early, Nolan Ryan on the mound, a rookie on the mound. I think they felt they had everything going in their direction right there. Uh, you could see the intensity in their dugout. They were all excited. They probably knew they didn't have to score too many runs with Nolan Ryan on the mound. Larry, you understand every game in this series, the Phillies had to play uphill. The Astros put the first run on the board in every game in this series. And, and that's how it was the whole season for us. It seemed like we were just climbing a mountain, climbing a mountain, and eventually it paid off. So, the Astros score first, they take the early lead. Coming up, the rare play that involves several Hall of Famers. You're watching MLB's 20 Greatest Games on MLB Network. Welcome back with Tom Verducci and Larry Boa, Bob Costas, as we review Game 5 of the 1980 NLCS between the Phillies and the Astros. The home team has scored in the bottom of the first. Phillies come up top of the second with one out and nobody on. Manny Trio faces Nolan Ryan. Manny Trio probably was the most underrated player that I've ever played with. Uh, everyone knows about his defensive uh, powers that he had out there, but this guy was a good offensive player, and uh, he had an unbelievable series against the Astros. So Gary Maddox followed with a walk, and that brings you up with two on and one out. And I think, no, he jams the heck out of me here. <laughs> and uh, might have been a double play ball, but he bobbled it a little bit. Goes to first. You always choked up. Did you right. choke up more against Ryan? Yeah, when he's throwing 97, 98, I got up <laughs> a little higher on the bat because I knew I was just trying to put it in play against him. All right, so now you got second and third. The pitcher Bystrom is on deck. There's two outs. Here's the number eight hitter, Boone. The question is, should they have pitched to him? Well, we all said we were sitting there, and they said they got to put him on. But obviously, if it was anybody else but Nolan Ryan, I think they would have put him on. Get up the middle, base hit, might produce two runs. Boom, with a sharp single to center, and the Phillies get the lead two to one in the top of the second. I just, I can't understand that. With first base open and the pitcher up next. That's what I was about to say when you talked about you love to have the pitcher open the next inning. That's another part of what I think of false mottos in baseball. The ball was still had a little bit too much of the plate. And he just fought it off. It was good hitting on his part. Just a mistake that no one obviously cannot make in that situation. No, and not the, the first type base of open and the pitcher on deck. You must find, feel like you've got found money at that. It, point. it was unbelievable because we all looked at each other before he even got the hit. You know, I was talking to somebody, Larry Christensen, and they said, "I said, you got to walk him here, don't you?" He goes, "Oh yeah, they're going to walk him." And lo and behold, he's winding up, and I went, "Wow!" So it turned out great for us. You know, as you listen to this, you can't help but smile. You listen to Cosell. Whether he's making a great point, as he often did, or a pedestrian point, you have to listen to it. He says, that's another example of the false bravado in baseball. <laughs> we'll just take care of this guy and leave the pitcher to lead off the next inning. Now, that's been said a thousand times by a hundred baseball announcers. But he makes it sound like a very important declaration. False bravado. I love that. <laughs> I, I could listen to him all, all day long. I mean, it was fun listening to him. How about watching the game, too? These uniforms. You talk about yeah. telegenic. You got oh. you guys in the baby blues, the powder blues, and the Astros. Had the rainbow. They actually had hired an advertising firm to design these uniforms, and it came out looking like laundry detergent. <laughs> yeah, they weren't too good at uh, looking uniforms on both sides, believe me. Did you get along with Howard? Yeah, I did. I really did. A I mean, couple of brash guys. Yeah, but he, you know one thing about Howard? He, he, whatever he said, if he was on the field, he would come right up to you. If he ripped you the day before yeah. or something, I mean, he would never hide or anything. So you had to like the guy. I told you this story. First time I ever met him, 1983 World Series. He's wearing that jacket. He's got that cigar. It's about as big as a Louisville slugger. The tube is just kind of <laughs> precariously atop his head. 83 World Series, Phillies and Orioles. I walk up, I say, Mr. Cosell, it's a pleasure to meet you. My name is Bob Costas. He says, I know who you are. You're the child who rhapsodizes about the infield fly rule. I'm sure you'll have a fine career. And he flicked the cigar ash and walked away. <laughs> now, anybody else, you say, 
What a schmuck. Yeah. But I'm thinking, this is great. Howard Cosell delivered a totally Coselian performance directed at me. This is great. I mean, you felt like it was an honor when he talked to you because, you know, you're doing the, the, the Monday night football and everything. I mean, this guy was a, a star. I mean, <laughs> for him to come down and talk baseball with you was something special. All right, so here we go. Cosell and Drysdale and Jackson are talking baseball, and the Astros are now trailing 2-1 to one as they come up in the bottom of the second. After an Art Howe pop-up and a Luis Pujols walk, Craig Reynolds is at the plate facing Marty Bystrom. Craig Reynolds at the plate. He's only had the ball out of the infield once in 12 at-bats. Looks as though that you've got two offensive units that are saying the same thing, and that is when they go up the home plate, make him throw strikes. Well, Trio had a great arm, but how about the catch and tag by Boone? Unbelievable. And, and the play McBride made, cutting off the ball. But Manny Trio had the strongest arm I've ever seen for a second baseman. And the only guy I compare him to right now is Robinson Cano. But he did this all year long, making relay throws like this. And if you watch the catcher, Boone, this doesn't exist now. Catchers catch balls out in front of home plate. He's blocking the plate. He did this numerous times during this series. And it was tough for that guy to score right there. But this was a big play that Manny, Bake, and Bob Boone all made. That's as good of a relay throw from an infielder as you're ever going to see. And you talked about Trio's arm. We got so used to him making those underhanded throws. But here, completely overhand, on the line to Boone. He had a great arm. And the distance of the throw. He's out in short right field. Normally, you bounce it. You use the turf and bounce it one hop. He threw it all the way in on the fly. All right, so the Phillies' lead is maintained at 2-1 to one after the great relay. Pete Rose delivers a single. Bake McBride fans. Here's Schmidt up against Ryan as they put up the RBI totals for the year. And Schmidt also led the league in homers with 48. Mike had a great year for us that year. And you're not going to catch up to fastballs up there. Rose over, slide trip, he's out. And Rose trying to steal second, tagged out. And there's an excellent play by the second baseman, Joe Morgan. A good throw by Pujols. The throw has him beat. Take a snapshot of this play here, Bob. That's a great slide. Brian pitching, Schmidt batting, Rose running, Morgan tagging. I mean, what an intersection <laughs> of some all-time greats on one play. And this is an unbelievable slide, but he didn't get his hand in there, and Joe stayed with it. That was, that was a great play right there. We, we tried, tried to, to be aggressive. Him a little bit there, you know? Yeah, he, he did. put his legs and went to the side, and Pete Joe Morgan, I think he saw that before. <laughs> yeah, Pete will do anything to, to, to make havoc out there on the bases, believe me. So it's still a 2-1 game, but this has had a whole lot of stuff already for a game that's just 2-1. to one. Well, we, we, you know, Pete wasn't really fast, but we tried to make some things happen there. We wanted to put Merns in motion. Hopefully we'll get an extra base there, but, uh, you know, Dallas said, let's, let's, you know, we got to be aggressive here. And people have to remember, Pete Rose in this game, he's 39 years old. You watch him play, you would never guess this was someone late into his 30s. He's 39, playing like he's 23. That's how he played every game. We've gone through two and a half. The score is two to one. There are more runs and more action, more controversy, more things to talk about on the way. This is MLB Network's 20 Greatest Games. They want away with a fastball, in with a fastball. He settles for the curve. Phillies are turned away in the top of the third. Come on. Look, good pitch. No one has struck out the last three batters he's faced. He's got five so far on the evening. The one two pitch. Got him. Well, Larry, as you said, near the beginning of the game. If Ed Vargo is going to give Nolan Ryan that pitch on the corner, forget it. I had no chance there. I mean, where he put that pitch at about 97, and I just walked away. That, that was a better pitch than the, the one they call Rose out on. That had a chance of being a borderline pitch, but Ryan's the kind of guy that you have to get him early. If he starts getting into a groove, and he feels that, the adrenaline, and the fans are into it, and, and his teammates are into it, he's tough to beat.
You know, Vargo didn't give him that pitch, really. He hit the corner. That was a perfect he pitch. He made a perfect pitch on me. I just, you know, hey, that's <laughs> Nolan Ryan. If I had to face him my whole career, I would have had a short career, believe me. <laughs> you can begin to hear, and not that he didn't in the beginning, but the crowd becoming a factor in this game. You know, we talked about the fact that this is the first time the Astros fans have seen postseason baseball. Now they're starting to smell it a little bit. Well, mm -hmm. as Ryan begins to settle into the game, and the home field, I thought, really began to play into their hands in the middle innings of the game. And, and, the, and the fans, very knowledgeable, they could see that he was dominating our lineup in the middle of that ball game. And they could feel it. The other team could feel it. And, and I'm not going to tell you that we gave up. At, at one time in that dugout, I looked around, and, and we weren't the happiest guys in the world because we knew what we were facing. It was an uphill climb, but... Uh, we still had some fight in us, and we knew that we had to battle and scrap and, and see what happens. I wonder how many of these fans had watched game four the day before and then come back out for a football game at the Astrodome in between these games. Crazy. Kickoff for that game, the Houston Cougars, Texas A&M, was at 12.33 p.m. because game four was almost or four hours long. A.M., so right? That's right, 12.33 a.m. Yeah. It actually ended, the football game ended at 2.41 a.m. I'm sure you stayed up and watched the football yeah, game. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, but you know what's amazing is you didn't know there was a football game because usually there's mark, you know, the lines are drawn and everything. They did a great job in, in converting the field back to baseball. They, they scrubbed it down. It looked like... Nothing had existed after that ball game was over the day before. This was really the heyday of the multi-purpose yeah. facilities. Yes. <laughs> no kidding. Now, as we go back to this game, and as you say, Nolan Ryan dominating in the middle innings, keep in mind it's still Marty Bystrom with the lead, with the help of his defense, still with the lead at 2-1. to one. This guy for his career was 29-26, and 5-0 and oh as a rookie in September of 1980. 29-26. Right now... He's pretty much matching one of the greatest pitchers of all time. Oh, he did a great job. I mean, we basically going in there, we felt if he could give us five innings and we were close, that we would be very satisfied because our, our starting pitchers were pretty much used up and uh, we knew Carlton wasn't available. We had to use Christensen. We knew that. But uh, we, if we could have got five innings out of Bystrom, which we did, that's what, what we were hoping for. Okay. The Astros are still down a run, as we said, despite the fact that Nolan Ryan is humming along. We will pick it up in the bottom of the fifth. Enos Cabell facing Bystrom. One out, Houston fifth, two to one, Philadelphia. The Astros with five hits and the Phillies with four. Hit to the hole. Enos Cabell finds the hole. Enos Cabell. And, you know, once you feel these fans starting to get, you know, I think it might have affected Marty a little bit. Uh, I don't think he's pitched on that kind of stage before. I mean, even though those games in September were important, the magnitude of this ball game, I'm sure he started to realize that, hey, I got a lead here. I got to try to keep my team in it. And they started getting some base hits. Pete Rose makes an unbelievable play right here. Robbing his old teammate Joe Morgan. Just a great play. Instant reflex. This one so now Cabell advances to second. He's there with two outs. And for people that never realized that that turf, that turf was like playing on a runway of an airport. It was exceptionally hard. And for Pete to make a play like this, this was a great play holding the Watch Rose. Around. He's calling off the pitcher even oh. before he's popped up <laughs> out of the dive. I've got it. No problem. Pete didn't make too many mental mistakes. All right. So the batter is Jose Cruz. He's the cleanup man for the Astros. Tying run is at second base. Now, Manny gets underneath this ball a little too much, and the ball sails on Pete. But the awareness of Pete knowing that the runner hadn't stopped, and again, Bob Boone blocking home plate like that is unbelievable. But most first basemen maybe would have dropped their head. Pete was ready. He slowed down, coming from third to home. He was watching instead the play at first. So here's Trio, who seldom had a misplay, but he pulls Pete off. Pete takes a quick look back at the runner, and here comes Cabell. Right. And Booney's right there blocking home plate. No chance. Just the awareness of Pete in that situation is just remarkable. Yeah, but that's, he never most, missed anything on a baseball field. Ever. And never mo most first guard. basemen would drop your head and say, oh, man, we made a mistake. He was ready. Bottom of the sixth here. Here's Denny Walling at the plate. And Greg Luzinski was a threat with the bat. He was never a nominee for a gold glove. That ball came back to him, and uh, he just misplayed it. He just misplayed it. 
That was a big play right there. Uh, you know, you, you don't want to give that team extra outs. You don't want to put runners in scoring position because you feel you got enough runs. You're not going to get that many more off Nolan Ryan. And uh, Bull just misplayed it. Walling was the leadoff man, so he's at second base now with nobody out in the bottom of the sixth, and the Astros trailing two to one. Not a good start. Not a good start. So here comes Alan Ashby to pinch hit for Luis Pujols. Up the middle, that's a base hit. Here comes Maddox. Here comes Walling. They've got to play at the plate to throw. He's not in time. Well, this is a great throw by Maddox. And again, Booney right there, he just beat it. Very nearly the third Astro cut down at the plate in this game. It's remarkable. We've had three plays at the plate, and they've all been a matter of inches, safe or out. Exactly. I mean, this is a, I mean, Gary Maddox came and got this ball on one hop, two hops, but he made a strong throw. But Booney, Booney is, is one of those guys that tried to deke him there a little bit, and then... It wasn't good enough because, you know, the, the runner Walling just barely beat it. Well, watch the slide by Walling, too. I mean, Straight you talk in. about sliding through the base when you that, get to home plate, not to it. He has the power to get through the leg of Boone here. Yep, it was a good slide. Straight in with the leg. Didn't do it with his hand like everybody does. He came straight in. So game five's tied at two, but one of these teams is about to break through. This is MLB's 20 Greatest Games. Back now with Tom Verducci and Larry Boa as we pick it up in the bottom of the seventh. It's a 2-2 game. Larry Christensen is on for the Phillies. So Christensen gets the top of the Houston batting order in the bottom of the seventh inning. Poole, DeBell, Morgan. Houston with a run in the bottom of the first. Philadelphia two runs at the top of the second. Houston answers at the bottom of the sixth. Ryan gets Philadelphia top of the seventh. And now Cool is up two for three. And Larry Christensen coming in in relief. Uh, obviously not used to this role. And he really didn't have his good stuff. Uh, he just pitched a couple days before. Just some, I think 90 or 100 pitches. This is the and bottom of the seventh, and Terry Poole is now three for four with that hit. I've I seen Terry Poole uh, around second base more than I've seen Manny Trio in this series. <laughs> he was on every single inning. Every time he came up, he got a base hit. Well, we should point out Christensen did throw the ball well. Now, he's working at only one day of rest after 81 pitches, but he had pitched well against this lineup in game three. Well, because they're pr predominantly right-handed hitters, and, and Larry got a lot of the right-handed hitters out. 2-2 two -two game. Cabell's going to bunt. You can see they're, 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 they're smelling it right now. They're having Cabell bunt, move the runner, nice bunt. Uh, Christensen just didn't watch these. If you watch these pitches, he just was up. He was up a lot. Man on second, one out. Morgan grounds out. Jose Cruz walks. Two on, two out. Denny Walling is up. Christensen to Walling. Hit the right field, base hit. Ball's right down the middle of the plate there. One thing about Houston, a very good fastball hitting ball club. And if you leave them pitches in the middle of the plate, fastballs, they're going to hit them. Now the crowd's really into it. You're not feeling real good about yourself. The momentum's changed. Uh, yeah, well, the one thing now, the noise is unbelievable right now. There is no containing this crowd now. The batter is Art Howe. But remember yesterday, and the Phillies eighth. Bounces, gets away from Boone. Cruz coming to the plate. Third. So Cruz comes across on the wild pitch, makes it 4-2. Was Boone crossed up because he was such a good defensive catcher? I don't know if he was crossed up, but I had never seen him miss a ball like that. He usually keeps the ball in front yeah. of him. And that's, you know, talk about momentum now. You can feel it out there in the field. You can see it in the dugout. And uh, it was a big play at that time. But... Uh, like I said, Booning very seldom. When he blocked the ball, it usually hit him and dropped right in front of him. He could have very easily been crossed up. I don't remember that, but 
he very seldom missed those balls. Christensen now done. Green will go to the bullpen again for Ron Reed. And the pitching change will now be made. So at this point, you're down two. Nolan Ryan's working for the Astros. It's looking bleak. The fourth Philadelphia pitcher, Reed in to pitch to Howe. And Howe hits the ball to right center field. It's in the gap. Going through. Going to the wall. Here comes Walling to the plate. Here goes Howe. Another fastball up and out over the plate. Yesterday, I remarked that this team reminded me of the Mets of 1969. Howe was left at third, but it looked like they had enough. Up five to two, after seven, Nolan Ryan on the hill. It looked like they had more than enough, believe me, at five to two. And I mean, it, I'm not going to lie to you, it, it didn't look real good for us, but. You know, that's why they play nine innings. That's why there's 27 outs in a ball game. So it was one of those uphill climbs. Well, let's remember, though, the night before game four, the Astros are six outs away from closing out the series. You're down two in that situation in the eighth inning, and you come back on them. Well, that I had the, to come into play in game five. Uh, no question. I think this team knew that we had a good ball club, and we weren't going to quit. The one thing about our ball club, we weren't going to quit. We were going to keep battling and scratching and clawing. But let's be honest here. you got a Hall of Fame pitcher. We didn't know it at the time, but we knew he was a great pitcher, that, uh, a, a dominating pitcher. And uh, we knew that uh, the odds were stacked against us. Yeah, the odds were stacked against the Phillies. But if the game more or less remained where it is now, would it be on the list? Probably not. We're coming back after this. Let's see if there's any comeback now left in the fields. They have to do it against one of the great pitches, regardless of his 11 and 10 season. And you don't give this big guy on the mound a lead going into the eighth or ninth inning because he's held that lead well over a hundred times in his career. That's a little looper, and it's past Reynolds, and Boa's on with a single. Well, the way this series has gone, you can expect anything. So a hopeful sign for the Phils as you lead off with a single, but both Don Drysdale and Howard Cosell are right. Cosell said you can expect anything, but Drysdale was correct. And to back up what he said, Elliot Kalb from our staff did some research. Over the course of his career, when Nolan Ryan had a lead and he pitched seven innings or more, his record was 241 and 5, <laughs> and his teams, if he was not involved in the decision, 252 and 12. But it gets better because if he had a lead of three runs or more, which he does here, it's 5 2, and he pitched at least seven innings, he, in the regular season, was 153 and 0. His teams were 156. <laughs> And two. Statistically, that's what you're up against. I'm glad I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, before that inning started, I was getting my gloves on, and I said to Pete, he came up to me, he says, get on, and we're going to score some runs. And I knew the situation. For some reason, I said, you want me to take a strike? And he looked at me, yeah, I want you to take a strike. You're not a home run hitter. So I remember taking a strike because I, I said, man, I don't want to have to hit that curveball. But he threw me another fastball on the third pitch, and I got a base hit. But... I didn't know those stats were like 153 and oh, I mean, those are unbelievable. Staggering. It's unbelievable. I mean, and I think Nolan Ryan was a very good postseason pitcher, but as we'll see in this inning, incredibly unlucky. You know, his teams were two and five when he started in the postseason, but his ERA was 3.2. And you started it with really, let's face it, a little bit of a flare, right. barely over the shortstop's right. glove. I mean, he, he just he was blowing people away. And I said, I'm just going to try to put this baby in play. And I found, found a spot out there. And little did I know what it was going to lead to. Well, here's what it leads to. Larry's aboard. Bob Boone, who earlier got a big two-run hit off Ryan, is up again. That's a double play ball right there. I mean, that to me is the whole inning right there. He, fell, he falls off towards first, but it wasn't that tough a play. And uh, if he comes up with that ball, Bob Boone doesn't run very good. Booney swung at the first pitch. So people want to know why is he still in there. Well, everything, I swung at the third pitch, he swung at the first pitch. And if you watch Greg Gross right here, he bunts the first pitch. So you're talking five pitches, and we have the bases loaded. Now look at this. Greg Gross Perfect. had more than 4,000 plate appearances in his big league career. Two bunt base hits. It was unbelievable. And now here he is in game five, dropping a perfect bunt. Now we have a flare and two infield hits. A flare, a DP ball off his glove, a perfect bunt, bases loaded, nobody out. 
And, you know, nobody thought he was going to bunt. We're down three runs. They're saying, oh, well, they're going to try to win this ball game. He's going to try to hit a double here and score a couple runs. But he laid down a blueprint bunt right there. And here's Mr. Trouble, Pete Rose. The Phelps who have never won a championship series. If they lose now, nobody can call them chokers. Nobody can call them quitters. They don't knuckle under, and they have. All right, back to work. 3-2. Base is loaded, nobody out. Look at the way Pete throws yeah. the bat away. Here we go. When he walked him on four pitches and he, ran, he was running the first, Pete said something to him. I don't know if the camera picked it up, but he was looking right at him. And they're, they're going to take Nolan out of this ball game. Well, Pete Rose, we always hear him called the all-time hit king. But if you ask me, that at bat, that walk, not a hit, a walk, defines who he was as a player. No question. He was not giving in an inch to Nolan Ryan during this at bat. It's a seven pitch at bat. Ryan made some great pitches in this at bat. And the way that Rose battled him through every single pitch to me defined what Pete Rose was all no about. No question. I mean, Pete's a winner, and that's how he played. Verdon replaces Ryan with a lefty Sambito. So Moreland bats for Bake McBride. And this, you know, it was perfect that it wasn't hit hard because Keith didn't run very good. So we got a fielder's choice there, and we're still feeling good about ourselves. So uh, it was one of those, if it, that ball's hit sharp, that's a double play. So now it's five to four. Ken Forsh in a righty lefty switch, Sambito out. Ken Forsh will come in. You've scored two runs, you've got two on. There hasn't been a hard hit ball in the inning. Right. And, you know, we got our big guy coming up, and he's definitely overdue. I mean, we know Schmidt drove in 121 runs that year. Uh, he was our bread and butter guy. I know he'd been struggling, but we felt good about ourselves. We felt right there Schmidt was going to put it in play. Not only did Ford strike him out, he struck him out on three straight pitches. I mean, that pitch was a perfect pitch. So he walks away, having stranded two runners. It's been that kind of series for him. With two out now and still down by a run, Dale Unser, always a good pinch hitter, bats for Ron Reed. Here is Unser now with two out and the tying run at third. But this is a good contact hit. It's a base hit to right center, and we're tied at five. Now, we got all the momentum going right now. I mean, we're feeling real good about ourselves. We got their big guy out of the line, out of the, out of the ball game. We've hit their relief pitcher there, and uh, we come picked ourselves off the deck and tied it up. Same old Phillies, huh? This team has done it. People of Philadelphia can feel proud of it. Win or lose. And come back yesterday, this incredible comeback now. Now Manny Trio is at the plate with the go-ahead run on third. Look at you jumping up and down, and, and Pete and Unser got the big pinch hit. He comes in to score. We, we were into it right there. I mean, Bob, this was some of, something that we, we had never been this close to getting to a World Series, and we were feeling pretty good about ourselves. We also knew that they had to hit a couple more times. But uh, to come back like we did against Nolan Ryan is something that uh, I still look back on and shake my head because it was unbelievable the way we kept battling. I wanted you to look at this at bat again with Rose because I thought he was the element that the Phillies team really needed. The one who really put you over the top. Joined the team the previous year. The Astros this offseason went out and got Ryan. This is the at bat to me, as I said, to find Pete Rose as a guy who never gives in an inch. There's no way he's losing this at bat, put it that way. No, this, this, I mean, he was battling. He, 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 he could feel this momentum change right here. And this was a huge at bat. He knew that this was a big at bat, not only for him, but for our ball club. Laying off pitches that were close right there. I mean, that looked like it was way up. But when Ryan throws a fastball that starts right at your waist, it's got some unbelievable giddy up to it. But Pete laid off of it, kept Pete, fouling pitches off. Pete faced Nolan 91 times in his career. 91 times. And his on-base percentage was 440. Wow. That's incredible. It's incredible that against the incredible. guy with this kind of stuff. But, Larry, looking at the body language of both Ryan and Rose during the course of this bat, you could almost feel the momentum changing where Rose is going to win 
and Ryan almost knows what the outcome is going to be. Well, I, don't, I really don't think Nolan wanted to give in right here because, you know, Pete obviously a doubles machine right here. He hits a double here. He's, everybody scores. And he was firing right here. I mean, he was throwing 97, 98 miles an hour, and Pete just kept battling and battling and got the big walk. Right there, he said something, and I asked him. He says, I told him that they're not enough. He told Nolan Ryan he didn't have enough to get him out? No, he says, they're not enough runs, he said. You don't have enough runs. Wow. So. Not too many guys <laughs> wanted to incite Nolan Ryan, but no. Pete might have figured the next time he was going to see him was next, next season. Year. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it was unbelievable. I mean, you talk about two competitors right there. That was, that was the ultimate challenge right there. You know, I was also struck by how stoic Bill Verdon always is. You can't tell looking at him if they've just come back or if they've just blown the lead. And quite the opposite in the Philadelphia dugout yeah. with Dallas Green. Right. We saw yeah. you and Pete getting excited there, but the manager also was getting excited. Well, you could see Dallas was starting to yell a little more in the dugout. He was getting into it, but when the camera was on him, he was pretty low-key for him. But Bill Verdon was like that, as you said. You couldn't tell if they were up 10 or down 10. So now Nolan Ryan has been knocked out during the course of this inning. Let's take a look at the final lines for Ryan and the Philly starter, Marty Bystrom. Here they are. Bystrom gave you five and a third, which all things considered was what you wanted. Very good. Yes, very good. I mean, for us to get that many hits off Nolan, that was something. And obviously the runs were something. But uh, it just happened to be one of those games where, you know, we got to him. And to look back on it, uh, I still shake my head. He struck out eight. And there was a stretch of the game, as we said, where he was as dominant as you expect him to be. But very often, big innings start with little things, and that's right. what happened in the eighth. Yeah, and again, it, it was a, the biggest play was the double play ball that Booney hit. He was just off balance a little bit. It went off his glove. He'd have been better off letting the ball go because the ball was not hit that hard and probably would have been a tailor-made double play for Reynolds to get, touch the bag and throw to first. You know, you always hear people say it would have been better off letting it go, but it's a reaction exactly. thing. You can't think, right? You try to tell pitchers that, you know, in spring training and everything, if the ball's not hit that hard, the guys in the middle are going to make those plays. But as you said, it's a reaction play. You're in the heat of the moment. And he probably thought he could have caught it and turned the double play. All right, so here we are. The Phillies now have a two-run lead, and they're going to go logically to their closer for two innings here, at least Dallas Green hopes. Tug McGraw getting ready to come in for the bottom of the eighth. And we'll pick it up there when we come back after this on MLB Network's 20 Greatest Games. Seven to five, and the crowd is in shock. As I am sure the Astros are in shock, and many millions of you are in shock. 5 2 lead, it looks so sound. I know the viewers that have been following us for all five games, Keith, they got to be saying the same thing that we've said. Can you believe it? <laughs> now what? Now what? Well, we're about to see, just as a three run lead with Nolan Ryan seemed like a lock. A two-run lead with two innings to go. Tug McGraw, peak of his career, ERA for that year, 1.46. That seems pretty safe, but Tug is running on empty, right? I tell you what, Bob, he was he was out of gas. He didn't have too many bullets left in the tank, and and I, uh, the crowd got real quiet there at the beginning of the inning. And I'm saying, okay, we we got him out of this game, and it didn't take very long because they jumped right back in it real quick. Well, Tug pitched in every game in this series. Game number three, he pitches three innings, throws 51 pitches. He's starting to get gassed. Game four, you actually took a lead to the ninth inning, and Dallas Green did not use right. Tug McGraw to try to save the game. He used Brewster. Warren Brewster right. pitched the ninth, blew the save, got to the tenth inning with a lead, and he pushes the button on McGraw and gets him into the game. And now here he is again for a fifth straight game, asking him to get six outs. Well, you know, physically, he wasn't that big a guy. He, he wasn't a big guy, a strong guy. But he would take the ball anytime you offered it to him. You know, he would say, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm good. And you could tell when you played behind him, his screwball had some good bite to it when, it, when he was on. He had a little life on his fastball. Everything was flat. I mean, just going side to side. And you knew he was out of gas. All right, here we go. Bottom of the eighth. Tug needs six outs. He's got a two-run lead. First hitter, Craig Reynolds. He stayed loose. He went to bed last night and got up this morning, and he's loose. <laughs> There's, there's a pitch right there. It was a perfect placement. Manny Trio makes a good play. Reynolds runs exceptionally good. And right away, you say, uh-oh, here we go again. I mean, he made a good pitch right there. He jammed him, but it was in the right place, and Manny did all he could, and Reynolds is an exceptional runner. Broken bad get, hit. Now here's Poole, who's having a great game. You can't get him out. I mean, just, you should just put him on. 
<laughs> I mean, it didn't matter what we threw this guy. It was unbelievable. He's the tying run, though. I'm afraid. Here's Terry Poole. There's one out here. Gary Woods had struck out. There's his fourth hit. And not only that, it's his 10th hit of the series. Oh, I know. Which is a new NLCS record. And who had the old record? The guy who meets him at first base, Pete Rose. And don't think Pete didn't know oh, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure Pete says, what are you doing up there? He said, we can't get you out. Yeah, Pete turned to him and said, that's what records are for. They're made <laughs> to be broken. No one knew that better than Pete. So here's Enos Cabell with a big chance. Runners at the corners. Tying runners at first. One out. Track three. You know, there, Enos is definitely looking screwball off speed there, and he threw a fastball. That ball's right down the middle. If he's sitting fastball, he probably hits that ball. But he was probably looking off speed. Now, you got Jose Cruz in the on-deck circle for the Astros, but Rafael Landestoy's got to get on to get him to the plate and to pull the Astros a little bit closer. He has only one hit to this point, as you saw from that graphic, in the LCS. And, and Tug makes a, this is a bad pitch. It's a screwball. He leaves it up in the middle of the plate. Get him to hold it up, Theo. Face hit. Run scores from third, Reynolds Poole to second, and he holds on. It's a 7-6 to six ball game. Now, that's the run that I was talking about, Keith. they got to get that run at least in from third with one out. There's the line drive. Just a soft line drive by Mike Schmidt. And let's remember, Landestoy came into this game replacing Joe Morgan. And it was the right move for Bill Verdon to make because Morgan had a little bit of a hamstring. So with a lead, Verdon wanted his best defensive team on the field. And that meant putting Landestoy in for Morgan. You know, the big thing this inning, we had Reynolds, we had Poole, and as you see right here coming up, Cruz, all left-handers. You're feeling pretty good. You got your left-handed closer out there. I mean, even though Tug was out of gas, I still liked our chances with lefty against lefty, and all three of them did damage. All three of them. Here's Jose Cruz. Up the middle is going to drop for a base hit. Here comes the tying run around third. And we're leaving at seven. I don't believe it. The go ahead run is now at third. And now you're out there saying, uh-oh, what now? I mean, how many more times can you keep coming back? And the crowd's into it again. And look how exultant Bill Verdon is. <laughs> <laughs> Calm down, Bill. <laughs> so the Phillies come back on Nolan Ryan. The Astros come back on Tug McGraw. And Dallas went out there, and I was right near the mound. He says, how you feeling? Obviously, I feel great. A lot of blue pits. He says, I feel great. Let me, let me go. Let me go. So, um, you know, Dallas was going to stay with him. We didn't have too many options at that time trying to get out of this inning, and uh, he got us out of the inning. He did, although he's blown the save. He still needs an out to escape the eighth with the game now tied. Denny Walling is the hitter for Houston. It's sharply to Bull at a shortstop. Over to second to Trio to get the force. <laughs> we have played eight innings of baseball in an incredible series between the Phillies and the Astros. And we're all tied at 7-7 going to the top of the ninth inning. Well, I think I'll just take a deep breath with you and rest. It's a remarkable display of two teams who have blended themselves together under leadership and who have about as much determination, as much spirit, much competitiveness as you'll ever see in sport. Well, here's the part that's a shocker given everything that's gone on in this game and in this series. The ninth inning is uneventful. Frank LaCordy on the hill now for the Astros takes care of the Phillies in the top half. Bottom half of the inning, you go to Dick Ruthven, normally a starter, but everybody's available just about for this game out of the bullpen. So he takes care of the Astros in the bottom of the ninth. And what do you know? For the fourth time in five games in the series, extra innings. Well, we were all out of gas. I know that emotionally, physically, uh, these games took its toll on everybody. But you, you didn't lose your concentration or the intensity always was there. And we just needed a break. And that's exactly what we got. You got Mike Schmidt leading off in the top of the 10th against Frank LaCordy. And Schmidt is just having a devil of a time in this series. 0 for 4 in this game. And here he goes against LaCordy. Two strikes on Mike Schmidt. And that's the book on Mike. You try to pitch him up and in, and he just had one of those series 
where I just think that he was just trying too hard. He, he carried us all year. We were in a position to get to the World Series, and I just think he's just trying too hard every at bat. In the eighth, when Schmidt fanned with runners on in a key situation, Del Unser picked him up following with a hit. Now here there's nobody on and one out, but it's Unser up again. Down the line to the corner by Unser. Unser around second, the ball comes in, and he stands there with a double. So that's twice Del Unser. A reserve has done it. There is a wicked hop off the AstroTurf over the head of Dave Bergman, who's playing first. And that's a break that we, you know, we're saying, hey, this might be it. This might be it. It, was, it took a bad hop right there. Uh, maybe it was because of the football game the night before. I don't know. But we needed something like that. We felt pretty good right there. But without our extra guys, Gross, uh, Unser, Avilas, Moreland, we'd have been watching the World Series. Those guys all contributed unbelievable for us. And you don't win a series with just your eight starting lineup. We had a good bench. Manny Trio flied out, and that advanced Unser from second to third, which brings up Gary Maddox with two out and the go-ahead run at third base. We're in the top half of the tenth inning of game five. Maddox is the batter. Gary swings. It's a base hit. Pull over, runs it. Run scores from third. Unser. To give Philadelphia the lead, eight to seven in the top of the ten. We felt felt good about ourselves right there, but we knew they had to hit, so we had to go back out there. Eight to seven. Bill Verdon still not giving <laughs> anything away. Another look at the hit, and as you say, Poole almost made the play. Unbelievable. I mean, I thought it was a hit as soon as he hit it. He just misses this ball, and this guy played great the whole series, and. It wouldn't have shocked me if he'd have dove and caught that ball because the series that he was having offensively and defensively. Here you are. That's the hardest ball I hit. I hit it too. <laughs> Pete says I hit it too hard. He says you got to just bloop it over the infield. So you got a one run edge to work with. It's 8 7 going to the bottom of the 10th. We've got a pinch hitter. We've got a pinch hitter now. Heap comes to the plate. Danny Heap. It'll be his first appearance. Hit the ball in the air on the left side. Pinch hitter Danny Heap looking to uppercut that ball and pull it, but instead he pops to you in shallow left. Poole was the next hitter. He had four hits in the game. He lined out hard to center field, and that leaves it up to the last hitter in the game, Enos Cabell. He hits it to right center field. Maddox going. It's over. That was like somebody just lifted a big elephant off our shoulders. I mean, we had come so close every those all those playoff years and come up empty. And believe me, when this game was over, there was no pressure when we went to the World Series. Every one of these games was pressure packed. Uh, we took it to the limit every game, and we just felt good about ourselves going in and playing Kansas City. And we'll talk about that World Series against the Royals and have more on the aftermath of this epic series against the Astros when we come back on MLB's 20 Greatest Games. Three two. He hits it to right center field. Maddox going. It's over. The Phillies win it. Eight to seven. So they are not the same old Phillies. They are the 1980 Phillies. They did it as hard a way as it has ever been done. They did it with a controversial manager, openly disliked by many of his players, but they did it. And they did it because somewhere within them, there was a spirit that would not be quelled. So it doesn't often happen that way, but the World Series, in a sense, after this, was anticlimactic. I'm telling you right now, I, felt, I never felt any pressure at all in any games except this series right here. It was just, it was something about the crowds, the atmosphere, um, knowing that this was our last year together if we didn't win, and to get there doing it the hard way like we did, I think it made us much tougher. We were very resilient, and we felt good going into this World Series. Quick story in the aftermath here. Terry Poole, we saw him outstanding series, 10 hits in that series. He said after this series, he went home and was sick in bed for a week. Couldn't get out of bed. He was just mentally, physically exhausted from these five games. I mean, that, that's how we felt. We were getting on that airplane going back, and, and I, I just felt drained. I mean, I wasn't a big guy anyway, but it was like 
you took a deep breath and you said, well, we finally got to where we want to go. And I don't think we were really thinking about the World Series. The fact that we had overcome this obstacle that we've been trying to do for three out of the four years, it sort of relieved everybody. And we went into that World Series. It was pressure free. As far as I was concerned, I felt whatever we did now was icing on the cake. And eventually we had a good series and we won it. Well, some of that relief I think we saw in Dallas Green. I'm not sure I've ever seen a manager sprint into the outfield to celebrate with his players in the outfield. And the comment I thought was very interesting from Howard Cosell about a manager openly disliked mm -hmm. by his players. At least some yeah, of his players. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know how true that was. I mean, Dallas wasn't afraid to pull the trigger on veterans. If you weren't doing your job, we respected Dallas. There were some things he did probably that upset us. But we all know that without him, we don't get to the World Series. There's no doubt in my mind that's what kind of job he did for us. Let's take a look here at some final stats. Trio, big series in the field, even though he did have the one error that pulled Pete off right. the bag, but it wound up not hurting you because you made the play at the plate, Pete to Bob Boone to cut down Cabell. But Trio did just about everything right in this series, including that big triple down the line in the eighth. No question. And, you know, somebody would have told me that, that your MVP, Mike Schmidt, would have had the series that he had, Dick, you would have won it, I'd have said there's no way because he was, he was that much of an offensive threat for us. And we picked him up, and as everybody knows in the 80 World Series, he was the MVP, so he bounced back and had a great series. He hit 381 for the series on 8 for 21 in addition to his fabulous play in the field. Right, and it was, it was something that you look back on and... Uh, you know, everyone says, does, does that bind you guys together? And it, it definitely binds our ball club together because we had come up short so many times and finally get over the hump. Uh, you still see guys at card shows and see them during the summer at times. But it, 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 there's truth to that when they say, if you win a World Series, is it forever? And it is forever. It's the great thing about baseball, isn't it? We talked about the superstars in this game, the all-time greats, the Morgans, the Ryans, the Roses, the Schmitz. And Manny Trio is the one who is the MVP mm -hmm. of this series and came up with the big hit. Yeah, you know, that really wasn't shocking to me. Not that he was MVP, but he, that's what kind of player he was. Very consistent. Uh, he stayed in the background, but he got big hits all year for us, made every play out there. Tremendous pivot on a double play. I don't care where you threw him the ball, he was going to turn it. But he had a great series. Let's take a look at the Astro lineup. Poole was four for six. Even when he made an out in the bottom of the 10th, the second out, that ball was hit right on the screws. It was a line drive right at, at Maddox. And I'm, you know, when he came up, that was the only guy I really thought in that lineup at that time. We're up by one. I said, the way this guy's going, he's liable to hit one in the seats. And he hit it hard, but it was right at Gary Maddox. And you really, really have to feel for the Houston Astros. I mean, they don't have any curses associated with them. Mm -hmm. There's no Billy Goats. But the fact is, they a terrible series for them to lose, having to lead in, oh. every, in every game. But also, their first seven postseason series, the Astros lost them all. Many of those games in excruciating fashion. How about in 86 against the oh, Mets? Right. <laughs> Just think about that one, which, which might show up somewhere I have a feeling on this list. Might. That's possible. I, I think what hurt them more than anything is that they had their, their guy they wanted on the mound. You know, if, if they had to start a rookie or, or their third or fourth pitcher in the rotation, you know, you might deal with it, but they had their big guy on the mound, and they had a lead, and it didn't work out for them. Let's keep this in mind. Even though you've won this nearly unbelievable series, you go on to the World Series. They haven't been in the World Series in 30 years since the Whiz Kids were swept in 1950 by the Yankees. You go against George Brett and the Kansas City Royals. Brett had flirted with 400 at 390 that year, and although you won it in six, change a few things, the Royals might have broken your hearts in the World Series. Oh, there's no question, because all we read about after we won that series was the uh, demise of Gene Mock when they had that in 1964. Nobody knew about that team, but by the time we got done reading articles, I knew every player on that team. I knew exactly how they lost, but they kept saying, oh, remember 1964 when Gene had that big lead and the Phillies blew it? So that was constantly on our minds after we got by the Houston Astros. And finally, to put everything to rest, to win everything is something that you never forget as a ball player. And Tug McGraw, who couldn't nail this one down in the LCS, was on the mound to finish it in the World and Series. And again, out of gas, but he struck out. Uh, Frank Willie, White, wasn't it? No, Willie, Willie, Wilson, Willie, Wilson, Willie, Wilson, Wilson, Willie Wilson with the bases loaded. And pitched in four games in that exactly. series, so he still had something left in the He tank. had something, but he pitched. I mean, you, if you did that right now with closers, their agents would be calling saying, what are you guys doing, trying to kill this guy? But Tug was the same old Tug. He says, give me the ball. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Okay, so that's game number 18 in our countdown of the top 20 games of the last 50 seasons. 
How to sum it all up? Well, even from the beyond, Howard Cosell demands the last word, and we'll give it to him. Very quickly, putting it in perspective, it was what we said it was, one of the greatest championship series ever played and probably ever to be played. Dallas Green's use of the word character is, I think, absolutely appropriate. Both teams showed character, tremendous amounts of it. But the Phillies, a beleaguered team in terms of their competitiveness and spirit through the media people through the years, have answered back and have represented the city of Philadelphia enormously well. They deserve everyone's congratulations.